Hello and welcome back for FlyQuest versus Echo Fox. Let's go ahead and take a look at the starting rosters to kick things off. Selecting blue side is FlyQuest. With Flame in the top lane, Onda in the jungle, Fly mid, Wild Turtle bot, Stunt on support, and Coach Rapid Star. And facing them on the red side today, it's Echo Fox. In the top lane, Hootie in the jungle, Dardock in the mid lane making his debut for Echo Fox is Demonte. Bot lane, all tech and support going to be Papa Chow with Coach and Arrow. Now, in the beginning of the season, well before Echo Fox's rise, people commented on the volatility of this roster and took bets on when the downward spiral of this team would take place if losses started to come in. And for six straight weeks, they held on to first place comfortably. The season was looking good. Then week seven hits. It's shaky but it's not terrible. It's different though, because now we see a couple of issues. There's some weaknesses here. Week eight arrives, Echo Fox goes zero and two. Now the question is, can this team ride the storm out or do they enter playoffs in the shakiest shape we've seen them all spring? And there's definitely a lot of question marks that are gonna come out because it's week nine and they're bringing in two new subs, right? These guys are guys from their academy team. And you know, I was able to actually talk a little bit to Anero today. And he was saying that this is not an attitude issue. This is not a performance issue. It's giving some of his starters a chance to kind of de-stress a little bit before playoffs. And also because he feels that Papa Chow and DeMonte have been playing exceptionally well in academy and also in some of their LCS scrims. So they wanted to give them a chance. And he felt that while it doesn't necessarily give them a better chance to get a playoff by, he thinks it will help them to do better in playoffs overall. So it is a risky line to walk because, you know, giving up that playoff bye and going in, you know, in shaky form perhaps, if they're not able to have a good weekend here, it does kind of hurt your confidence a lot and may not have them being as prepared as you would want. And you could see that Hooney in particular was frustrated with Echo Fox's losses last week, and he'll be facing off this week against Flame, who had a solid weekend for FlyQuest. Yeah, Flame brought out the gangplank versus Golden Guardians and did very, very well. Uh, we've been talking a lot about how he is kind of the star of this team, and last year he carried a lot and was able to find these picks that really fit him. He hasn't been able to really find replacements for the Renekton and the J4 that he was so successful on last year, but finally brings out the gangplank. And while every lane was behind but him, uh, he was still finding a lot of success and able to kind of be that star, be that carry for the team that they so desperately want. And that's exactly what this team needs to see, right? You've got to have that win condition. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the game. That's what it's all about. And they hope that they can see him step up or maybe see one of the other members step up here today and take that fight to Echo Fox. Because even if you are up against one of these teams that has been at the top of the standings throughout the entire split, it's like we already mentioned, there's two new names on this roster. So there could definitely be some opportunities to exploit that. There definitely are. And Clutch is is cheering for FlyQuest right now. You know, oh, yeah. 100 Thieves is cheering for FlyQuest now. So is Cloud. And all these teams that are kind of in the hunt for these playoff buys that are trying to compete to knock Echo Fox down a peg or two uh, really are looking for a FlyQuest win. 100 Thieves now is tied with Echo Fox and wins. They are sitting at 11 and 6. With an Echo Fox loss here, that means they are tied for that second spot. And that is a really not where Echo Fox wants to be. I love how you enter into these situations in the last couple of weeks of play where certain teams become like the number one fans of yeah. other teams <laughs> just because it's so important for them to win if that first team can get the spot they want to get. So we'll have to see if FlyQuest can make everybody's dreams come true here today. They ban away the Varus, the Brahm, and the Kha'Zix. Echo Fox banning away Olaf, Zaya, and Azir. Skarner is available, so is the Swain. So there are definitely some picks to look at. Uh, Skarner going to be locked in, makes sense as a trade. You know, there's not the Olaf to be given over, so prioritizing that as a first pick, pretty big. But Echo Fox could grab up the Swain. Maybe we'll get to see that for the first time in the NALCS with its revamped kit. But definitely, there's a lot of kind of cheerleading going on in the NLCS this last oh, weekend yeah. Oh, yeah. because there are a lot of teams whose fate is not necessarily fully in their control. You know, CLG is looking to try to punch their way into the playoff picture, but needs some help uh, from but TSM, from TL, from yeah, from teams to beat them. And some of these teams that are looking to steal away a playoff buy from Echo Fox and Cloud9 are going to need some help from FlyQuest here too. All right, Echo oh, Fox is. does get that Swain, so we're going to see that one on either Hooney or DeMonte in his NALCS debut this spring. Mm -hmm. And while I do think it is stronger as a, as a mid laner and the statistics do show that it is quite a bit higher win rate in mid lane, it's so strong that you can definitely play it top or mid. Mm -hmm. And 
there's a lot of extra power in having it as a flex pick because you don't really know exactly where they want to put it. You don't know who's going to play it. And that makes it a lot harder to kind of pick and ban against that uh, when you are looking for counter picks. And uh, you could be proving me wrong right here. If they're going to lock in the Casio, that'll certainly tell you where it's going to go. Absolutely. We'll see if Demonte wants to go with this pick that we've seen him tear up on in the North American Academy League for those that have been following that throughout the course of the split. He's had a couple of impressive performances on that champion so far, so they'll lock that one in for him, Comfort, okay. which means Hooney will be the one piloting the Swain in its North American LCS debut. As we enter into the second part of the bands here, we'll see what the teams want to focus on. Oriana, banned out first by Echo Fox. And Demonte has had a very impressive Casio in the Academy League. He is 3-0 and zero with an 11 KDA on the champion, He's so good has at been crushing on it. I do like the idea of really trying to get these players who may not be used to the NALCS stage, get them comfort, get them in their zone where they know how to play, where they know how to work, and really try to get them as relaxed as possible because that's where you're going to see early success because it certainly is a different level of pressure playing on the stage in front of fans, knowing that all these people are watching. Right, so you get him that pick that you know he's able to win on, that he can perform on. You ban away the Oriana, something that might be a bit of a pain point for him. Put him in a spot where he's able to play at his best possible ability. FlyQuest will ban away the Morgana. So they don't want anybody black shielding a Skarner full target or <laughs> protecting him from any of that kind of damage. The other ban from Echo Fox will be the Scion that we see ever so popular these days. Yeah, and Scion is actually showing up a, a fair bit in the mid lane, right? So that could even be you know, another kind of protection type pick if you don't want to deal with a banner rush Scion as is Cassio, which would be incredibly annoying Real to deal with. So uh, definitely could be a nod over to there. Uh, it is going to be the Alistar for Papa Chow. And he has been someone who has really been sticking heavily to the tanks, has not actually you know, won a game in Challenger on range supports. He has been all about tank duty, all about the prom, all about the Alistar, as second most picked champion uh, this split. And he's done okay on it, you know, split the games two and two on the Alistar so far, but it's definitely gonna be an, an interesting one. Also means more Orange. disengage for a team that already has Cassiopeia and Caitlyn. So synergize is pretty well, but FlyQuest they grab some disengage of their own with the top. Oh, Kent. Nocturne. Well as the... The Nocturne. Oh. Forget everything else. We okay, yeah, Nocturne. I don't even care about this anymore. We got Nocturne locked in for Dardog. Right. I was going to mention how I like the Zac ban from Flag. No, you don't like, like oh, that yeah, anymore. Take, take away this. Dardog's good at that. But no, <laughs> Dardog says, nope, Nocturne. Oh, my God. This is going to be pretty hype. The new Nocturne has been buffed. Uh, the ultimate actually lasts two seconds longer, which is such a big deal as far as denying globals when you look at it at the professional level. You cannot be TPing in when the Nocturne ult is active. You're not able to do that. It's very disorienting in the team fights and really has the potential to look to try to pick off people in side lanes, especially if you're trying to get some split push going. So very interesting, very exciting composition coming in here from Echo Fox. A lot of new picks. We got two new subs. This is definitely a fully revamped look for the team, but on the other side, we have a bit of kind of consistency. We have a lot of tanks coming in. This is really a four protect one style comp for FlyQuest. You have Tom Kench, you have the Orn and the Skarner for the front line, and then you have it a karma. mid lane Karma to buff him up. So this is all about Turtle. He needs to have a good game for FlyQuest to win. If Turtle falters, the entirety of FlyQuest will with him because there's no other real damage source. I mean, the way Skarner is built in the LCS, he's a full tank. The way Orn is built, he is a full tank. Everybody on this team, okay, Karma can provide some damage. Maybe if she builds some, some heavy AP, gets a death cap in there or something, but you're still looking at it all revolving around that Kog'Maw, but it will be Dardoch's mission on Echo Fox to assassinate that Kog. Plenty of help from the team as well. Definitely so, but it is gonna be really difficult if you're trying to go in as, as a one-man show and dive in onto that Kog'Maw. Stunt on this Tom Kench can simply eat you away and, and protect you from that ultimate. There is a lot of frontline. The ultimate shield, the mantra shield there coming out from Karma is going to be massive with all the AP that he is building up. So definitely a lot that they have to work through. Uh, but looking like we've got some action here on the bot side as, as they're looking for a bit of an invade. Looking for an invade as the top laners sort of trade auto attacks back and forth. Swain autos versus an orange shield results <laughs> in a uh, whole lot of nothing. Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten times you ever look at it, and this will fall into one of those times. It is pretty interesting, though, because the, the first revamped Swain that I actually myself watched on competitive was in the LCK uh, and it was actually brought out as a counter pick to Orn, right? So we have seen Flame actually picking that into it from the other side and 
This is pretty nice. You're actually getting a bit of damage there on the turtle. Uh, maybe going to force him to, to base, but doesn't feel like he has time. Uh, either way, you know, this is, is going to be, I think, a, a tough matchup perhaps to withstand uh, for Flame. You know, in that matchup in the LCK, it did end up going fairly even. The Orin actually had you know, more pressure. Uh, but this is Huni piloting the champion, and this is a very buffed up version of the champion as it has gotten multiple buffs a couple patches in a row and really is at the point now where he has so many stats in his kit. He's so much stronger, and especially his W, the vision of the Empire, is actually so big now that it's yeah. exceptionally difficult to avoid, which allows him to have those slows, allows him to have more access to those soul shards to kind of buff up his ultimate and, and really become more powerful. And it's not just Swain as a powerful champion. We're talking about Huni as a powerful player. Even in <laughs> some of the games where Echo Fox has looked shakier this split, it's usually been Huni who's the guy standing out as this guy is pulling his own weight. This guy is trying to make sure this can still somehow be a win in some way, shape, or form. He has been a power player and honestly been so critical for this team's success. He really has. And it's, it's worth noting that you know, he is not playing airy, which is more of the kind of lane dominant rune that you would go if you're really trying to push in and kind of bully this guy out with poke. Instead, he is going phase rush, as is Demonte, which is much more teamfight oriented. It can give you a lot more access to the back line if you can actually hit your combo. You throw out the never move, you hit the vision of the Empire, you hit them with your zap, you go into ultimate, and you're kind of zooming in onto the back line, trying to close that gap and really get into the middle of things. So we'll see how well he's going to be able to utilize that. And also how Fly is going to kind of hold up here against Demonte in the mid lane on his Comfort Casio. Now let's go ahead and tag in on some of the extra Skarner knowledge that I'm sure people are always so dying for in these new jungle matchups. That's why I watch LCS. Yeah, you got to get the Skarner knowledge. The big thing between these two junglers that we're going to see, if they run into each other, can Dardox spell shield the Skarner fracture? If yes, he's fine. If no, he's not. And speaking of being fine, Flame's got to make sure he doesn't get pulled back like that from the Swain too frequently, because remember, that is one of the activators for the Soul Shards. That's going to enable Huni to get some extra healing. It's going to make it so once he has his ult, that ult becomes that much more powerful. You've got to avoid some of that CC and not get yourself yanked back towards that big threat. Definitely the case. And it is cool to see how they drafted a little bit around this Swain, seeing that there's the extra crowd control here, especially with the Alistar. Um, because if the Alistar can combo the Kog'Maw, then you can use the Swain passive off of that CC to pull him into the rest of your team and really mess up his positioning. So not only is Turtle going to have to be on point with avoiding that crowd control, if it does ever tag him, Stunt is going to have to be very good about instantly pulling him out before he can get yanked into the team and, and put into that rough spot. Huni putting Flame in a rough spot here, chasing him away from the minion wave. And like we saw from the passive pull effect earlier, this isn't just a tiny nudge in a direction. He pulls you quite a few units. Yeah. And it can really disjoint where you're at in the team fight and catch you by surprise if you're not used to playing against it. I would assume Even if all you are, players. <laughs> it's pretty disorienting. Yeah. It is it is one of those those skills that can be very frustrating to play against, especially when they do have a CC to set it up, like with the Salsa. All right, you can see Onda clearing out some of the vision there in the river. Spying out where those wards are as DeMonte turns some attention back towards Fly, who is honestly bullying him around a little bit right now. He's behind a bit in farm, but considering he's got control in terms of both health and mana pool, Fly's still feeling pretty all right here in the mid lane. Onda will move up into Dardox jungle. Doesn't get anything with the fracture, but he'll be able to capture the point and walk away. I'm also going to be very interested to see what Dardox's interpretation on the build is. Uh, you see quite a, yeah. a bit of actually attack speed Nocturne. I'm not expecting that. Uh, on ladder, a lot of people are playing these sort of Devourer builds. In my opinion, going Warrior, going kind of more heavily into CDR uh, style builds makes more sense as far as competitive play. It's more playmaking. Exactly. You have more playmaking. So much of it revolves around the ultimate, and you really do kind of have to have that style, and especially in LCS, it's not going to be a split push style build, you know, with the attack speed. So, you know, going more lethality, uh, something like Warrior into Dustblade, or even Warrior Cleaver uh, can be pretty powerful, but. You know, Tank Nocturne is not very strong, so it's one of the champions that really does not have very good fallback. Uh, you generally have to be kind of this suicide bomber, dive in, take someone out, and then you know, either you live or you die, but that's, that's really all you That's kind of irrelevant, right? Yeah, exactly. Because either you take them out, and that's what matters, whether or not you completed that. You living afterwards is a bit of an afterthought yep. when it comes to how that Nocturne will be going into these fights. But once again, it's all about the guy you see on your screen right now. Wild Turtle is probably going to be the single most important player out of all 10 in By this far. game. 
considering so much of FlyQuest is built around him. And Turtle is a player that has had some incredible moments and had some moments where he definitely overextends himself in the past. And he's going to have to be extra careful and extra aware of exactly how aggressively he's positioning this game. I mean, like you said, if you get yourself caught out by an Alistar combo, if then you get pulled back into the team by the Swain, if then all of a sudden you're on top of a Cassiopeia Miasma, your whole team's done. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much to see if you get hit by one of them, you know, pulled into the Cassio all, pulled into a Caitlyn Trap, pulled into the Nocturne Fear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much there. Uh, but at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of protection built around him. And if they cannot burst him down, if they cannot take him out, uh, he will be frightening in the team fights. And this really is showing a ton of faith from FlyQuest in him because it's not just about putting him on a hyper carry. They have built the entire composition top to bottom around protecting him, around enabling him. And now it's his responsibility to kind of make good on that and, and find his way to succeed. Now, talking about successes, we have both junglers ultimates online right now. You just saw Dardoch get his available by taking down his red buff for the second time. I want to see who succeeds in making that first gank work because for both of these champions, the first use of the ultimate needs to be a success case if you really want to get rolling. Yeah, it really does. And Dardoch is working towards the warrior, has elected to go for the challenging smite. And that first ultimate, as you say, is so, so big. And in the ideal Nocturne game, you're essentially alt on cooldown, get a kill, power farm. Yep. As soon as your ultimate comes back up, go for a gank, go back to power farming. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And try to get super, super ahead in gold so you can get to that point where it's a you know, one-shot type kill when you are going in. And we'll see if, if he's going to be able to do that, if he's going to be able to find those openings, or you know, if he's going to have to be a bit more patient. Because this is not solo queue. This is a team playing very intelligently around that. You can see you know, multiple pink wards in the bottom side river around the jungle, you know, knowing that Darda could be coming through this river looking to alt onto the Kog'Maw. That's who they want to put behind. And I think this is a cool pick for Dardoch specifically because we've seen him have so many good moments this split on the Zac, which is a champion that has a lot of engage range and a lot of unique gank paths because of that. And Nocturne falls into that same thing. Of course, it's more exaggerated because it's his ultimate. It goes a lot further than a Zac he will eventually. But you have to ward different locations. You have to always be aware of that. And that's one thing that's going to be on FlyQuest this game. Like you said, keep those pink wards everywhere. Make sure yep. you're always aware of those avenues he has for approach. And it's somewhat similar in that way to how you have to play against Eve, how you have to play against Rengar. You want to be able to deep ward um, because if you can get vision down on your opponent's camps, then you can really start to see him before he could get that ultimate off, right? You need to kind of have a pre-warning that, okay, Dardoch is clearing his bottom side of the jungle. That means we back off, right? That means we don't expose ourselves to these sorts of ganks. But Onda looking to actually just start up the dragon. I do believe he spotted Dardoch walking across the ward in his own jungle, going over to the top side. So this is just going to trigger them to initiate on the dragon, try to get this back. But it seems like Dardoch may be aware of this because he's moving back to an empty bottom side, trying to perhaps contest. For those who aren't aware, Skarner is actually incredibly adept at soloing down the Drakes. He did has, have his teammates rotate over to help him with that as well, but because of his spammable shields and his spammable damage through the Q, it makes it incredibly easy to lock that one down on your own. Stun going to go ahead, use the Devour there to keep Wild Turtle safe. And there's some of what you were talking about, which even if Turtle might happen to step into a bad spot, there's a lot of get-out-of-jail-free cards. He's got a whole deck stacked full of them. Dardoch moves into the enemy jungle, looking maybe for an opportunity here. Flame knows something's going on, and you can see this is one of the things about Nocturne. When the Dustbringer's fired off, it can let your opponents know where you're at. It can, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, a lot of Nocturne players who are pretty experienced, you'll actually walk behind the Gromp and shoot it back in towards the jungle to not actually trigger off that warning. It's the same thing if you're trying to steal your enemy's raptors. You don't want to shoot that over in mid lane and give that away. So uh, it's something you have to be careful about because it is such a, a long kind of skinny skill shot that it just shoots over the wall and, and they can see that. So they knew exactly where he was and that can kind of help them to extrapolate where he's going to be. You either fire it off early or like you said, you walk around behind and shoot it the other way. Either, either or prevents it from going over the wall and sort of giving that extra information that wouldn't otherwise be available. But right now, we're still looking at a game that honestly could not be closer. Azale, 16.3 to 16.2 thousand gold after 10 minutes. Neither team on the board with a kill or a turret. The Drake, the only thing that's been taken so far. FlyQuest giving themselves that as Dardoch will look to farm up his own Raptor camp. Well, this is almost all of them. But yeah, that was not the ideal clear. Yeah, didn't have his smites. So Onda steals away the big Raptor. A couple little ones were stolen from Fly with the Mantra Q there. 
And Onda is just going to go straight over to this Rift Herald and trying to get another objective for his team. And I do think that FlyQuest is going to be pretty happy about how this is actually going. You can see in the top side, Flame is actually you know, up in farm. Uh, yes, Uni is not indexing super heavily on, on actually going for a lane dominant style, but it definitely is something you have to be wary about when you're fighting against these sort of kind of group five team fight type teams. You don't want to give them too much time to to get to their power points. Now, one thing I've heard in a discussion about Swain recently from different people is tier. Because we know Archangel Staff is such a ridiculously powerful item right now. And I mean, so much of who's good and who's bad in terms of mages revolves around, well, how well do you use this item? And there's a discussion between Swain players about, well, it seems very greedy, yeah. but is that greed going to be worth it? And it seems like this game, Huni says, yes, we will have enough time. I can farm this up. I don't need the superior tankiness from just rushing a rod of ages. Yeah, exactly. And I've actually experimented with the, the tier Swain a fair bit. I was a, a big Swain player uh, pre-rework and have been playing around with it quite a bit on, on the new Best patches. in 2016, there I remember go. the Best graphic in saying. Yep, uh, completely accurate. Yep, and not shooped at all. Yep. And it is one of those things where when you rush the tier, you do feel exceptionally squishy. You do feel uh, very vulnerable to especially pre-6 ganks. But if you're going to be playing this passive style, if your jungler is going to be warding for you, if you're going to be into you know, a semi-non-interactive lane, you know, the orange shouldn't be able to all in and kill you if you can get away with more of that greed. Uh, if you are against something that is more aggressive, like if you're playing against you know, an all-in style champion or someone with Ignite and these sorts of things that can kind of rush you down and burst you, then I think it is harder to get away with. But that being said, He's not in that style of game. And Abyssal Mask is exceptionally strong, I think, in this game where you know all the damage is coming out from like a Karma and from Wild Turtle, who is mixed damage. So going into something like a Seraphs plus the Abyssal Mask will make you ridiculously tanky, give you 30% CDR, then you build into your Zonias, you're at 40. And that is an exceptionally strong build for a Swain in, in this match in particular. So I think it is very intelligent. And while it is greedy and much slower to turn on, it's much more of a scaling style build. When you get there and when you have the Seraph stacked and the Rod of Ages stacked, he's going to be a monster. Well, both teams seem pretty content playing this game slow and steady to win the race this time around as Altec and Papa Chow will move up into the brush, clear some of this vision away. Not really too afraid of anything going on around him right now. You can see the farm just across the lanes right now, very even, slight leads in both the bottom lane and the mid lane for the side of Echo Fox. You already mentioned the lead that FlyQuest has in the top side of the map for themselves. And Jungle staying pretty even. We know how Swarner likes to farm very quickly, very effectively. You already mentioned the same thing about Nocturne. Jungle items completed, though. Warrior fully done for Dardoch. It means if he can get one of these ganks off, the burst will be very real. I kind of like this. Just drop the Rift Herald on the top side. One of Swain's real weaknesses is his very poor wave clear. I, I do think he really struggles to actually clear out waves effectively. You see there's a Banner Rush. You see there's a Rift Herald. That's just going to be first turret straight up. And it's Solo Gold on a Flame, which means he's going to be even more immovable as he moves towards that Abyssal Mask of his own. So I think the build is very intelligent. The way that he's played this lane out is very intelligent. Um, but it is... You know, a turret going the way of Echo Fox here, too, and that's kind of what they've gotten now with this Caleb. Yeah, I really like the fact that Echo Fox recognized what was going on. They put Dardoch bottom, and they say, look, we know you want first turret. We're just going to get it five seconds faster. Mm -hmm. So well played by them as a team. We still got a dead even game between them, honestly. No kills. 14 and a half minutes in. First item completed onto Fly's mid lane Karma is the Athene's Unholy Grail. So it's yeah. kind of what I was expecting with that more supportive type of mid lane Karma, not the pure AP. Yeah, I think this definitely makes a lot of sense. I could see him doing this into something like, you see Ludens if you want to you know, splash in a fair poke. bit of damage there. If you want to be able to poke people out, that can be pretty powerful. But you also can just go with Seraphs of your own. You can go relatively defensive and supportive. Uh, then get something like a third item death cap to buff up their shield. But they're going on to him. Oh, it's Papa Chow looking to set this play up as Darda comes in with the missile from long range away. And it's first blood over to Demonte. No way to react to that. The flash combo into the Casio, into the Nocturne off. That is very well executed by Echo Fox. Takes them 15 minutes to do it, but they get the first blood. <laughs> Better late than never. Echo Fox is on the board. They put the money on the Cassiopeia, one of those big damage threats exactly the way you want to execute. A good job there by Papa Chow, making sure he sets up his mid laner for success. And this is not what I was expecting to see at all. A Tiamat on the Nocturne. This is like so, I just want to farm. Yeah. Uh, that is this very is rare to Q. see. Yeah, that is that is really solo queue. But here it is, Papa Chow skirting around that pink ward. And there's just almost no time to react here. So look at this from Fly. He still has no idea that Papa Chow is here. Flash combo, no chance to react. There's really nothing he could have done at all there. Now that was just perfectly layered, perfectly executed from Echo Fox, and 
That's the thing of beauty. Buys them a lead, buys them another Drake. Well, buys them their first Drake, I should say. And puts them in a spot where they're feeling all right going forward. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look real quick at exactly what the cooldown is. Dardock has slightly over a two-minute cooldown on that ultimate. So a little yeah. under one minute left to go before he can pop that again. And going back to what you said earlier, it's kind of just the farm game until then. Because so much of the champion revolves around having that big ult. Yeah, it really does. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, it, it, I can understand the thought process if... You're saying, okay, we have two tier users. Let's let them stack up. Caitlyn doesn't really want to fight till later. Let's let Caitlyn kind of build up. Well, if all I'm going to do is farm, then I guess get a team at. That kind of makes some sense. But at the same time, uh, you are going to have a lot less CDR. So your ultimate is going to be active much less often. And I don't know. Maybe he's going to go like Warrior, Titanic, Hydra, Tank or something. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Ravenous Hydra yeah. would really surprise me. But this is not something I, I can honestly say I've seen. So it's going to be kind of fun to, to discover it along with you guys and see where he's going to go. Also worth noting, the Tiamat is a burst item of its own, right? Yeah. It gives you the active, adds a little bit of extra instant damage to any sort of a combo. or It does, but it's also not a dust plate, right? Let's, yeah. uh, you know, it's That's... not that level of burst. And I will give you that one. Yeah. So it's, it certainly does add damage. It is not, you know, something super defensive, but it is more about farming. It is more about the wave clear and then the push and everything. So we'll see how, how they want to actually play it out. And you can see Dardock's health bar on your screen right now that was taken down to about two-thirds from a single inspired mantra Q mm -hmm. from Fly. So you've still got to really respect the damage potential on your opponents when you go for a build like this. Because we've talked about how Turtle makes one wrong step and he's going to get blown up. Well, if you're a Nocturne, you're not much tankier than a Kog'Maw if you're no. going this kind of a build. No, I mean, you really are squishy. And that is, that is why it is generally a one-way trip. But... Again, if, if you go tank, sure, you ult in the back line, and then what do you do, right? Like, you do very little. So uh, I think it is one of those cases where it's, it's better to just build damage. That's how the champion really functions. If you wanted to build tanky, you shouldn't have done that regardless. And okay, so he's just getting a Tiamat for farming, and now going back in towards what is going to be a Ghost Blade or a Dusk Blade. Uh, this is pretty atypical, I have to say. Uh, there is, you know, some logic to it, definitely. You know, he wanted the Warrior completed early for that initial power. Uh, but generally, if you're going to go Tiamat, you see people just straight up rush the Tiamat right off the bat right. to be able to power farm. But uh, that would make you weaker uh, than when you initially have your warrior. So he's, he's kind of doing a little bit of a catch-all. Dardoch decided to go in here onto that Karma, but with the full might of Whoa. three enemy players right there, he makes a serious mistake, and Flame gets the kill for the punish. Oh, man, that was uh, Gilius levels. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. He's taking some lessons from his buddies in EU. We'll have to see how that plays out for him. Mid lane tier one under some pressure here, nearly taken down. Fly kept Fly Quest can't quite Hoonie's do it. In there. Hooney makes his way into the back line, immediately popping the demonic ascension. Gonna be draining HP from everyone around him. They grab the kill onto Onda. They're able to make it two onto stun. And the counterattack from Echo Fox is there. Flame gonna be pulled back by the power of the passive from Hooney, as now Fox thinks they can finish what FlyQuest could not. Take down the tier one. They're gonna get a lot of damage onto that from Alltech. Huni will zone the rest of the team away and they grab the objective. Yeah, really nice TP coming in there from Huni. They're able to trade back a couple kills after Dardock uh, gets taken out. FlyQuest was waiting for that one. They knew where he wanted to go. And he goes straight into his own death, but at the same time, when you have that extended fight, all of FlyQuest was there and Wild Turtle was not. And he is what the whole composition is built around. So in he goes, uh, but yeah, the Skarner had already shown me it was the same time to everything, or maybe they didn't quite see him around the wall. Either way, Flyquest was was lying in wait, and they were fully prepared for that. So makes Dardock look a little bit silly as he gets first down. But then again, Kogma is on the bottom side of the map. All of Echo Fox is here in this four-man squad, and there's not much damage left in the tank here for FlyQuest without the Kog'Maw in position. So when he comes in, hits some nice never moves, pulling them back in. They're able to clean up a couple kills. At the same time, Wild Turtle does knock down a turret on the bottom side, does pick up some farm. So you know the gold trade is relatively even with a couple kills going each way, plus the turret on each side. Still a damn close game overall. About 500, 600 gold separating the two squads. One Drake each, same kind of Drake even. We'll have to see if FlyQuest can finish off this turret here. I would doubt there's no reason that they shouldn't be able to. There we go. That's going to put this game back up to dead even. More farm there for DeMonte to take 2-0 and 1 on this Cassiopeia. Leandri's Torment already done along with that Seraph's Embrace. The Abyssal Mask already completed for Huni, like you were talking about with that build that will be so effective in the mid game. I mean, you saw what he was able to do in that team fight. Once he teleported in, you just turn on the ultimate, stand in the middle of multiple people, and survive. Yeah, very nicely done. And 
Nice spell shield by Murdoch oh. getting out, but Demonte is just gone, and Turtle is free. Demonte taken out immediately means Papa Chow is likely going to be going down next. Stunned up and brought down. No way out of that one, even through the ultimate. Fly Quest finds two They're going to free. ban. And now they can move over to a bigger objective. It's up to Huni, Alltech, and Dardoch to try to stop this one, but it's three versus five. And there's there's no summoners on Alltech. There's no flash on, on Dardoch. So if Alltech gets too close, you could just get initiated on it and take it down, and they're going to catch Huni here, perhaps. Huni in some trouble. Immediately going to be pulled Not back. He'll be enough. stunned up. He is gone, and without him available for this fight, you would think that there's just got to be no way Echo Fox can yeah. try to stop this. Five strong for FlyQuest in the pit. I mean, all you can do as Dardoch is try to alt in and get Vision to do that. If he can alt in, then maybe try to steal, but they're actually backing off. FlyQuest? What? Call a, hold on. That is bizarre. Like, that is very strange. Yes, people are respawning on the map. Yes, there is some small chance that Dardoch can get Vision and alt into the pit and try to steal it, but that is like, that seems to me like a 70-30 or an 80-20 play. For FlyQuest, I actually am shocked that they just backed off because there's no TP on Demonte. There's no TP on Papa Chow. It's not like they can just join the fight immediately. Right. They could have easily finished that, I think, and, and had an extremely good chance at taking that Baron. I, I'm shocked that they didn't go for that with a flashless Nocturne as the only option to steal that and no summoners on Caitlyn. Well, FlyQuest makes the call to retreat away. Echo Fox just wipes the sweat off their forehead, yeah. happy to get away from that situation with only the losses they did. Now they'll move that jungler and AD carry combination down towards the Drake pit once again, grabbing the Mountain Drake for themselves. A little bit of extra objective control moving forward. FlyQuest will still be hanging around the Baron pit area as Huni moves back up topside to clear away some waves. Pops that Squire's Bloom on his way there to just be mindful of everybody nearby on both FlyQuest and FlyQuest's vision game. But yeah, very strange choice around the Baron Pit because FlyQuest's advantage is not incredibly really what it could be. Incredibly risk averse, right? And yeah. that is that is what they're thinking. You know, the only real justification I have for that is you're saying, all right, we're so much stronger later that even if it's a 70-30, we just win 100 percent later and we don't have to risk right. it. I'm not just saying I agree with it, but here's the play again. Dardock nice spell shield on the Orn Alt. He saves himself, but you know, nothing that can be done to save Demonte. He gets taken down. Papa Chow gets taken down. And this is what prompted that extended play where they then got the pick on Huni. They're then in a 5v2 situation with a couple of summonerless opponents and they decide to pull off the Baron. And let's talk about what this means for FlyQuest because remember, this is a team that's not able to make it into playoffs. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you're looking at the end of Spring Split, when you're looking at the fact that if you're not going to playoffs, this is the last week of play for you until summer, just because FlyQuest is coming back in summer, doesn't mean you're going to be on the FlyQuest yeah. roster. Every single one of these players wants to perform, wants to stand out, wants to say, I'm going to be a valuable asset for us come next split. Make sure I'm a part of this team again. Yeah, you need to prove that you're LCS worthy, right? And, and now it is FlyQuest onto the Baron. They see Huni on the bottom side, but this is going to be a 5v5 situation. They do get out the TB from Huni. We'll see if they go for the fight. They're not really low. Into this one, already having to pop the flash to get himself away. Ornold flies out. Onda looking to go in, make the play onto Huni. Not quite going to find it just yet. Stunt devours him up, keeps him safe. Injured, a couple of injured health bars on both sides. Walks everybody away. Huni no ult. Onda was not able to get the flash out he was looking yeah. for either. He flashed in there, not able to get the range, so he has to be eaten out and, and taken to safety. Uh, well, they do, they do trade the TP for the flash. And they are going to have to kind of just reset as Captain Flowers is having a, having a laugh there. <laughs> just having a good time with the team fight, man. Nothing wrong with it as FlyQuest and Echo Fox both burn a couple of flashes. You saw even as Huni came in yeah. on the teleport, he immediately flashed away because he was like, wait a second, I'm too close to Skarner. I got to get out of here. Yeah, backing off very intelligently. Dustblade is now done for Dardoch, so definitely the threat of being able to burst someone down here is massively higher. He definitely can really, really put some hurting on to Turtle. Uh, you're really hoping to see the Devour already used from Tom Kench before you right. go in, though, because this is such a difficult game, honestly, for Dardoch to find success on this Nocturne, and their whole draft is quite atypical. Yes, Swain is tanky and can be quite tanky, but is not a tank. You really have one tank in the Alistar, and that's about it, and a lot of people are running multiple tanks these days versus you know two pure tanks on the side of FlyQuest, plus that kind of pseudo tank in the Tom Kench, which is the equivalent of the Alistar. So it's tough when there's there's only one real target for the Nocturne and there's so much protection from him. How do you find that success? I mean, every single time you hear Nocturne say darkness, if you're fly, you're just ready to hit that empowered E, protect turtle, 
And what, what are you going to do? I don't care if you've got a Dust Blade. It yeah. doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you've got Red Smite. I don't care if you somehow trade your Flash out for Ignite with no spell buff. You're still not going to kill him through all that protection. And I mean, if you're stunned, you're essentially like you're those kindergarten kids and you're tied together by the wrist. You're falling <laughs> out on a real rope. You're not allowed to leave. This as, is your buddy. As soon as you hear Darkness, you can just eat Wild Turtle and the ultimate can expire. Well, there comes a big Orn ultimate going through. Papa Chow going to be in some trouble. The heal keeping him alive only a moment longer. Still able to mount the counterattack in time. And Onda goes down. The burst into the damage from Echo Fox is now they may be able to find yet another. Oh, there's the ult for Dardoch. around quickly, but Dardoch goes too far. And FlyQuest will punish. Hooney's already gone. Papa Chow with another big combo. Nicely done there from Echo Fox, though. Turning it around ends up being a three for three. Dardoch actually ulted in on Flame, it looked like. Trying to finish off the Orn, but uh, overestimating his damage, perhaps. Either way, not able to keep Wild Turtle alive and all the CC overlap they are able to find the kill on him. My MVP for that fight is Papa Chow, 100%. He's at 5% HP at the start of the fight and ends up getting two big headbutt pulverized combos that just make things work for Echo Fox. Yeah, so we'll watch this one again. Papa Chow getting chucked down incredibly low. You see the Orn initiation catching three, but Papa Chow barely surviving. The never move caught over onto Turtle forces the Devour out of stunt. And now they're looking for the reinitiation as the Orn gets very low. You see Dardoch ults in for the kill, trying to get on him, but that's no damage coming out from that tank who is shielded up. Turtle here, though, comboed by Papa Chow. Very, very low, as you said. Goes back in, gives his life to take down Turtle. That's where you give him the, yeah, the support salute. You will that's, be remembered, friend. That's the hero of the day right there. Goes in. <laughs> Not only throws the Kog'Maw up into the air, but the Tom Kench right beside him, so there's no save, there's no get out of jail free card. That's what you want to see. That's yeah. how that needs to be played by Papa Chow. And you saw earlier on the screen when it was showcasing how many games these players have had in the North American LCS in the past. Demonte, this is his fifth game on the NALCS stage ever. Papa Chow, this is his debut, period. First game ever in NALCS. That's the kind of a team fight you want to have in that situation. Echo Fox looking to force the fight here. It's going to be Flame on the front line. Papa Chow already popping the ulti as the Orn horn oh, is blown. Three. Able to find its way onto three, but Echo Fox already in a spot where you can't quite collapse God. on him. That Mantra soul play there onto DeMonte. Takes about half his health, and that is Luden's Echo build. Going for a death cap third as expected. Uh, going to be really buffing up those shields, making an incredibly strong turtle working towards his fourth item. Uh, is going to be really, really a, a tough nut to crack. Mountain Dragon spawning, FlyQuest in position, and, and although it was a really good Orn knockup, chasing through those corridors can be so dangerous uh, as they don't have vision into that bush, and you know that Demonte is going to be lying in wait. You know all the AoE damage and CC that can come out of a Swain plus the Cassio, so uh, playing it pretty intelligently and pretty defensively, but they have full control over the Baron area and really can look to force Equifox to come to them. And I like how aggressively FlyQuest is playing this. This doesn't look like a team that's trying to play super safe and just avoid confrontation and let Kog'Maw get six items. They know that they have the Kog'Maw, Juggermaw comp scaling, but at the same time, they're not afraid of a fight. They're not afraid of the fact that they're up against this team that has been so good throughout the entirety of the split. And that's the kind of bravado I want to see. Yeah, and I mean, Turtle has the most gold in the game. That's exactly the position you want him in. You want this guy who is going to be your win condition to be the strong player, to be getting funneled that gold, and he is going to certainly have his chances to succeed. You can see Knight's Vow is going to be built up here by Stunt. You're expecting Lockets to come in. You're expecting all the protection in the world for this guy. And just then give, give him the wheel and, and let him see what he can do. Dardoch's health bar, by the way. Once again, that's a single Karma Soul nice Flare. Move, though. So very difficult for this Nocturne to escape unscathed from some of the damage coming out from FlyQuest. But Echo Fox is ahead on the rotation. They lay down the Caitlyn Traps. They get the Tier 2 turret for free. They tie up the turret count. And 30 minutes into this game, they're 100 gold apart. Yeah, we are dead even. That was just really good macro play there from Echo Fox. Your opponents take control of the Baron area. You take control over the mid lane and force them to come back to you. Both these teams are trying to posture, trying to force their opponents to fight on their terms because the, the area in which you take that fight is so ridiculously important. At this stage in the game, 30 minutes in, where these champions are all so powered up, you have to make sure you're taking the right fight. Because the right fight means you get bare, means you win the game, and the wrong one probably means uh, it's lights out. You can make the big play that wins the day, or you can make the play that completely throws everything out. But right now, FlyQuest, with the two-man Baron attempt, 
Stun and Turtle are all you need. They don't bother attacking the ward because that would give away what's happening. They just take the Baron. Echo Fox is none the wiser. And now FlyQuest is sitting pretty. Yeah, that was really nice. Showing Onda and showing you know your jungler, showing your top laner. There was not really any expectation from Echo Fox that that Baron was going on. And it just means that they're able to sneak it straight up. So all that vision control they've had around the Baron pit for so long, those triple pink wards finally paying off. And now it's so hard to delay any longer against this FlyQuest team with the Baron buff, with all the gold pouring in. They can base, complete their items, and just group five and straight up walk down the mid lane and force Echo Fox to engage. And I'm not sure that Echo Fox is going to be able to find a winning fight on a straight up engage. 507 AP now on Fly's Karma as well after having completed that death cap thanks mm -hmm. to some of the money they got from Baron. So you're not looking at an easy siege situation if you're Echo Fox. Yeah, I mean, such critical items just came in. Full completed Blade of the Rune King for a turtle. The Knight's Vow is now done. That's going to be on Turtle. The death cap on to Fly to protect him even more. So all these completions coming in just make it so much harder to kill this guy. The potential they have in team fighting, in a straight up fight, is so, so strong. Let's see if they can do it. They've got a banner available on Flame as well to utilize with this Baron buff. He's pushing up in the side lane, does have TP available. If he needs to make his way into the fight mid, he'll be dealing with Huni in the bottom lane for now. As Onda and Fly will rotate themselves over here as well, threatening towards Huni, saying, You better not step up and try to keep our Orn away from this as Stunt and Turtle. Utilize the Abyssal Voyage, put Turtle in the position to lay the damage onto this Tier 2 bottom side, and that's another turret going the way of FlyQuest. Yeah, nice rotation from them, just utilizing that TK ult. It's already pushed up there by Flame, and Flame has his banner available, so they can look for the banner plus cannon that was nerfed on this patch. It's not as strong as before, but it is still a pretty powerful sieging opportunity. Stun gonna get chunked out here, but for Echo Box, it's all about finding the pick. And right now, they're looking to find the pick on the stun, but instead it's going to be Huni, who's maybe tied up a little bit here, while Turtle going to be laying down some DPS onto him as Flame provides some cover. Turtle's utilizing isolated. the ulti. Turtle flashing over the wall, keeping himself safe. But they lose Fly, and Echo Fox has found the fight. Yeah, I mean, FlyQuest opt into that fight, but they do not have Turtle with them. If you are FlyQuest, you do not get to pick a fight unless Wild Turtle is already there. He was split off on the side with Fly. The only three members there when they're ulting him in, when they're trying to engage onto Huni, are your Orn, your Skarner, and your Tom Kench, right? Where is the damage here as they are trying to force into this? Turtle is off to the side in a pretty awkward, vulnerable position. Uh, he was not really able to get a lot of the damage out. And then watch fly over the wall. Papa Chow goes in, and he just got destroyed by a crit over the wall there from Altec. So nice pick from the bottom lane. And we've been talking so much about Wild Turtle this game, so much about the hyper carry potential of a Kog'Ma. Let's look across the lane here at all techs, Caitlyn, because this guy's sitting on 3-0 and 3. He's got those three big Caitlyn yeah. power point break items that make him such a big team fight threat. He's now got that fourth item fully completed with the Lord Dominic's regards. This is not a low DPS enemy AD carry either. FlyQuest has to respect this. No, not at all. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of damage in the Echo Fox comp, and, and that is what it is all about, right? You know, can they burst down someone before FlyQuest can kind of take this slow measured fight where they're whittling you down? Like, the Cassio is huge too, right? This is a three kills on Cassio, three kills on Caitlyn, both with a tremendous amount of farm, both with a lot of items, very, very strong. The burst potential coming out of Nocturne is huge too. And Huni is getting to a very strong point as he has his three items. He has completed his kind of scaling now that the Seraphs is finally built up. So it's, it's definitely not an easy fight to win for FlyQuest, but they need to keep Turtle safe. And again, separating from the team means it would be hard for him to go in. All right, Flame's got the ulti. Looking to start things off with that. Papa Chow goes in, finds his way onto Wild Turtle. He's going to be the only one, but a lot of damage coming down onto the back line. Even the front line of FlyQuest is shredded as Echo Fox already claims two, and they've got FlyQuest on the run back into Echo Fox territory. Huni doesn't know about chasing this one any further. Just buy some time, throw out the Vision of Empire when it comes up, keep them from getting back to base, and Echo Fox will be able to shove up in the mid lane, five men strong onto the inhibitor turret. That's a big fight win. Yeah, this is gonna be the inhibitor turret, but potentially they can push for more. They have more minions coming. We'll see how, the, how far they wanna take this. It would be risky, but could look to get some Nexus turrets. It looks like they are gonna make a call to just back off, but Huni gets Whoa. a kill on to fly as well. The icing on the cake. Echo Fox has seen everything go their way in the past few minutes. They definitely have, and it just feels like time and time again, Turtle is getting split from the main team. You see, he retreats 
up over kind of that river by himself and you know he does get a little bit back to the team with stun but but just watch the pathing and this is actually the after play as we see Huni probably just gonna blast going over and look for that kill on the fly not able to hit the never move but the, the W nicely done just burst him down I mean the, the kind of shotgun lightning coming out there if you are yeah. close and able to hit all those bolts does a really high amount of damage at this point in the game and fly needs to remember just how squishy he is he has built zero HP on the karma so he has a really really low health and while your shields are very strong if you ever get hit without a shield up, you pretty much just instantly die, and that's kind of what you saw there. I and mean, this guy's 1,900 health, right? Like, that is, that is very, very low and, and almost no defensive stats. Yeah, Death's hand right now, tooltip damage for the full shotgun blast hitting you is 765. <laughs> so two and a half of those, Yep. he's dead from full. Yep, pretty scary position to be in. And Echo Fox, again, just going to be pushing down. So it really does... It's, it's one of those games that just all comes down to one player and how they are able to play around that player on their team. And it is about Turtle. It is about can Echo Fox zone him out or take him down and can FlyQuest finally kind of find this fight where they are together, where they are defending, where he is free firing because in, in the last fight he's pushed out by Papa Chow. He's not really you know behind that front lane and then all the damage piles in and when it is just pure damage dealers versus just tanks of the other team, the damage dealers will win. The tanks cannot yep. actually survive at this late stage in the game unless they have their own DPS pumping out damage behind them. So you need Turtle standing behind the Orn, attacking those squishy damage dealers who are attacking him. Turtle won't have too many more chances, honestly, if the fights keep going no. the way that they're going. You can only afford to lose so many team fights before Echo Fox just has what they need to put the pedal to the metal and in the game. So if you're gonna turn it on for FlyQuest side, you've gotta flip that switch soon. You really do, but the Baron is coming up, the Elder is coming up, and it may just be again about fighting for those objectives. But with the mid lane hip down here for FlyQuest, they're gonna be pressured and they're all doing a lot of damage to Papa Chow there. Let's force out the locket, which is pretty big team by cooldown. Papa Chow almost risky. dead. Critically saves the ultimate, though. If he can get back and heal and make it to the team fight before Baron, he'll still be full value. I mean, you look really good when you survive there walking away, but that was really close to him just straight up dying to that ultimate. If you go down, that's almost guaranteed to be the Baron, but he is running back to the team. They are on this and it is going down fast. Dardock is going to have to try to get in there. Demonte warding over. Dardock pops the ulti. Everybody from FlyQuest keeping close to each other, making sure if Dardock jumps in, he's not able to find that isolated target. Stunt keeps Fly safe. Fly got to be so careful about that damage from Alltech. Even a single crit can take off half his health. Nice. Honda trying to look for an opportunity here, maybe to make a pull, utilizing the power of the speed boost from the Righteous Glory. Flame still on the front line. I think FlyQuest just has to back out. I mean, the mid lane is pushing in, and they didn't actually fully commit to the Baron. They backed off, the Baron reset, then they tried to go back onto it. And this may mean it's simply an Echo Fox Baron. They're gonna be the ones starting it up. Turtle is trying to clear out the mid lane, but you cannot fight this without Wild Turtle. They are kind of segmented again here, and the team fight may begin. FlyQuest knows they've gotta get Turtle in here. Echo Fox doesn't know how far away he is though, so they'll back away from that fight. But now we may just get our full on five versus five. Miasma thrown down, keeping FlyQuest away. Echo Fox doesn't need to fight. They shouldn't fight. Look at the mid lane. The super minions are on the Nexus turrets. All you have to do is wait and just keep threatening to start this. And they are on it now. FlyQuest has spotted it, but can they get in there for the steal? The Orn ulti not able to be used and fired back. Dardox secures the Baron for F Echo Fox, but can they get themselves away? Flame's gonna be taken down, he goes too far forward. Alltech goes unstoppable, and FlyQuest just not anything they wanted to happen happening right now. Wild Turtle forced to be saved right now as Dardox makes his entry with that ultimate. Gonna be in the middle of the fight, the double kill That's over that. to Alltech. And that is it. They take down nearly the entirety of the enemy team. That last one shot down as a Caitlyn triple kill will seal this game in favor of Echo Fox. Pop the QSS just because he can. They're on to the Nexus. It was rough for a while, but this is why this is a playoff team. Echo Fox just peel them apart, not able to ever get that proper fight that they wanted. FlyQuest will fall, and Demonte and Papa Chow are gonna get their LCS win. That's what I'm talking about. Demonte 3, 1, and 9 on that Cassiopeia. Papa Chow 0, 2, and 13 on the Alistair. Not a bad game for either one oh. of these two. I mean, honestly, a really strong showing out of both of them. Uh, Demonte looking really strong in the mid lane, uh, really able to kind of just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fly and come out better. I mean, at the end of the game, he's up 70 CS. He's contributing to team fights very heavily. 
And Papa Chow was looking quite decisive in a lot of yep. those fights, finding the engages, finding the way to keep Turtle out or to kill Turtle in those fights was so critical. And this is a, a pretty impressive game where you sub in two people and it's not about Dardock, it's not about Huni, it is about the bottom lane that has been struggling, it is about the success of their mid laner. And they honestly did a really, really good job today and could be very happy with that. Echo Fox played it very well. They played it very coordinated. They bought the time they needed, but on the flip side of the coin, FlyQuest, we talked at the beginning of this game, Azale, it will live and die by their coordination around Turtle, yeah. by their ability to turn him into that juggermaw that just destroys the entire enemy team. And in so many critical moments, the team wasn't on the same page. And that's really the make or break with those sorts of compositions. When you see a successful Juggermaw composition, the team is grouped together, the Kog'Maw is just behind the tanks, the tanks are moving forward, and the Kog'Maw is free firing. In so many of these fights, the Kog'Maw is split from the team, the tanks are split from the Kog'Maw, they're not on the same page, they're not together. And when the tanks are taking damage without the Kog'Maw dealing damage, the composition just straight up falls apart. So uh, that's kind of what happened to FlyQuest, and honestly, has felt like the story of FlyQuest for a lot of the split. The drafts can make sense, but they're not able to execute. Well, Echo Fox was able to execute here today, so to hear a little bit more about how they did it, let's send things down to Avali and Echo Fox's Bull in the Bot Lane. Thanks, guys. I'm here with Papa Chow, who just made his LCS debut today with this victory. <laughs> applause for you. A lot of applause for you. You have a lot of, you just made a lot of new fans here today. What does playing on the LCS stage today mean to you? Playing onto the LCS stage to me means a lot because it's something I've been chasing for many years now. And I even went to back to college just to play ULOL for it. <laughs> well, speaking to that, it seems like you had the true path to pro. You went from collegiate to academy to playing on the LCS today. What can you tell me about that journey? Uh, I feel like the journey was pretty long, <laughs> but... Overall, I felt like the journey was worthwhile because going from college to an academy, I learned how to like take care of myself and like how to be independent, and it only just helped me further improve my like social skills. And I feel like it just it was like the building pa building way to like LCS, I guess. Now I'm sure there are a lot of players out there who are aspiring to be just like you. What advice would you have to them? Always try your best. Perfect. Well, try your best. Congratulations again on your win, Papa Chow. And for more on the game, let's hear from the analyst desk. Thank you very much, Avali. Papa Chow picking up a win, his first LCS appearance alongside DeMonte, who also subbed in for Echo Fox, although not his first time on the stage. We're going to break <laughs> this down, but we got to welcome Kobe to the desk. He's subbing in for Jat. us. Exactly. We've got our own sub. Come to save you from the false up. prophet. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's glorious to have you on the desk. Jat thinks he's better than us. He gets uh, to go hang out with, you know, Dardock and, and whatnot. Setting the winners. Up the NALCS lounge. <laughs> Just a bit. Exactly. The winners. But uh, taking a look at this game and the way it broke down, we had a couple new picks showing up. The Swain we talked about at the beginning of the day, but Nocturne as well to follow it up for the side of Echo Fox. And the Nocturne for me is the one where I start scratching my head a little bit. You have Cassio, Caitlyn already selected. You have Swain as well. So you have these like pretty strong champions and the only frontliner you have thus far is Alistar. You really want another body to get in between people because if the Alistar loses his ult, he's basically useless. And even then, you saw a lot of times Cogma just chunking him out because it doesn't have real tankiness. So the Nocturne left me a little bit scratching my head. Didn't see too many successful use cases. It did feel like they were testing a lot of different points at the same time in this game. They have two new subs and two new champions popping out here on the Right, patch. they're not controlling any variables here, Kobe. No. How, do you, how do you even begin to parse through whether or not anything was a good decision? Well, uh, we can start with the Swain, because okay. that was Huni on the Swain, and Huni is the player for this team, right? Uh, like Mark said, you know, Huni is, or uh, Swain is actually a really good mid-line mid, uh, champion here. Does a lot of damage, also fairly tankily. Tanky, we got to see both of those um, in this game. However, the Nocturne, we also got to see why Nocturne, in all of the stages uh, that this champion has gone through, has really only been successfully implemented by the Gigabyte Marines. Yeah. In an early game blitz strategy, you know, lots of cross map plays, trying to use the ultimate for pressure, uh, you know, rushing him to level six by doing extreme Double jungle, jungle strategies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whereas Loved it. in traditional, uh, you know, more setup five on fives, a lot of the times the Nocturne, especially when you're building like this, 
Um, okay, so here's the one success. <laughs> that, that, 15 that minutes in. Go yeah. for him. And uh, then it all goes bad. Exactly. You end up as a very squishy champion because you have to build all damage here. You, you want to be able to, uh, you know, take out your target, even though against this team where it's a Kog'Maw. So you're like, I want to kill the Kog'Ma. They have four tanks. They have a shield that they can give the Kog'Ma and a Tom Kench. So really later in the game, your, your use cases drop very, very quickly and it becomes very difficult for a Darduck to you know, pull anything off in this game. Yeah, Huni did a good job on Swain. He started a couple fights out well, and then they started struggling a little bit in the mid game. It did feel like FlyQuest might walk away with the win here after they won a couple skirmishes in a row, as well as eventually grabbed a Baron buff. And this is what we're talking about, where Papa Chow, without his ult, becomes very, very squishy, and there's no one else to frontline. He actually plays this fantastic. As he's about to die, dodge some damage, re-engage for your team, gets out with the help of the Nocturne ult, protecting him, and then he's actually gonna go back in and re-engage. So even though, you know, Dardoch's going in, pulling a lot of attention, dies again, uh, and Huni as well is gonna get dropped. Papa Chow's re-engage on Turtle kind of saves this fight as it allows yeah. Altec and Demonte, the two real backline carries, who is the core of this comp, who they don't protect for some reason, that time they actually do. I mean, it feels like a fair time then to transition towards the two subs and how they play today. We've already, of course, heard from Papa Chow himself, but also Demonte in the mid lane, farmed up well, had a solid score line and pushing out that damage in the mid-game team fights. Yeah, it makes you start to think about the reasons for all of these changes, you know, all the different test points that we talked about here. Maybe heading into playoffs, we know that you have to declare one substitute for your team. So maybe they were thinking, oh, we're going to give both subs some stage time. Then maybe this will decide which one we want to declare. Right. Um, the Alistar definitely looked very good. Demonte has also been doing you know, quite well in uh, the Academy League. So that may be one of the other things. Azale talked about wanting to also give the starters some rest. So. Right. And then there's the real extreme possibility, right, that they're actually looking at this as a possible five-man roster for playoffs itself. And so with that in mind, how would you assess the play here in game one for both DeMonte and Papa Chow? I thought they both looked good. I think Papa Chow having a little bit more agency than DeMonte was able to stand out more. And especially given this comp, it didn't feel like either team had like the support to exactly shine because we're talking about we want another front liner for them. So it was a weird comp to have to play. And the fact that they were able to bounce back and win was really good. But yeah, there's so many things that float in your mind because we heard Azale talking about at the top of the day, like, uh, you know, they're doing this to let their players de-stress. And it's like, you know what else helps you de-stress a lot? <laughs> having a week off because you got to buy having so. a week off, but also seeing your team pick up wins. Hey, they right? won, I mean, they won the game anyway. Yeah. Still in that hunt for a playoff buy, actually. The victory here did not secure that for them, so they're still going to be looking yep. towards tomorrow and some other things to shake out to see where they land for the official playoff picture, but 12-5 and five, sitting pretty. And now as we have a special guest on the desk, I'm very excited to offer Kobe the opportunity to stump us with some puzzling <laughs> statistics. So Kobe, I'm going to hand it over to you. Ah, oh, I'm a huge fan of Jat stats. So I brought you some Kobe stats Woo! for the day today. It's not as rough. It doesn't, well, yeah, it doesn't roll He's got the, the, the T at the end, yeah. so it rhymes better. Uh, yeah. But y you guys are going to get the idea. And uh, I hope that you will do better in Kobe stats than you do so in do I, Kobe. stats. So do I. I've got three for you. Question number one is, uh, who was the only jungler in 2010, long time ago, yeah. to win a gold medal on the international stage? How many Ooh. tournaments even give out gold medals? I was going to say, exactly. do we exactly. give out gold medals? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think, think we, we do, right? It's all about it. trophies. And so, yeah, I have a feeling on this one. So it might be some I kind got of like a feeling Olympic I heard of this guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of like some, a beef. Maybe, it's maybe, like a beef, a certain yeah, kind of maybe, beef. Maybe, maybe it's, it's not just like... You know, war oh. World. Ooh, the world. Right, oh, I'm up. The world I think it's Kobe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kobe. Is it Kobe? Yeah. Kobe Success. 24. Yes. You both. Kobe 24. You That's true, like actually. At that time, oh, 24 was bonus there. Bonus point then, what team? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> All right, both of you are 100%. So I love far. it. I love it. Question Can number we stop now? two. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What jungler this season, mm. present day, has an 83% win record in solo queue on Shaco? That's five and one. Well, you know, this is a, I this think was a pro it, jungler, it, right? Was a, a pro know. jungler at one point. He was. <laughs> Uh, I got uh, I've got an inkling on this one. If you've got an inkling <laughs> on this one, you want to say it on three? Yeah, okay. Been one, the two, here. three. Kobe. Yeah. Oh, Mark. Mark. <laughs> oh no, it is, Mark. Uh, I think it's Kobe. Yeah, this, sure, this, you this. sure you were. Sure you were. Jad is also a big fan of the NBA, so we've got an NBA question Ooh, for you. Ooh, I yeah. like it. I okay. like it. Okay. Now this one's a little bit more tricky. Um, this player uh -huh. is the only player. Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers uh, have retired two jerseys for. Yeah, that's, two that's LeBron James' team, right? 
Uh-huh. <laughs> I just stared at you like the death. They're like, <laughs> what are you saying? No, no, no. Uh, okay, I, uh, you know, I, I feel like this was kind were of a toss. the numbers uh, 8 and 24? Were those they numbers? were. Oh. Good hit. I yeah. think eight you're on the right trail. 24, 24 equals Kobe? Kobe, yeah. Well, three right. for three, yeah. ladies and I'm gentlemen. So proud of wow. you guys. We <laughs> nailed it. I like Kobe stats way more than Chad's <laughs> stats. Yeah, You're welcome great. on my desk anytime, my friend. Up next, Team Liquid look to secure their spot in the postseason versus Cloud9. And to hear from some pros, tune into Riot Games 2, where Jat Hooney and Dardock will be bringing you the game from the NALCS Labs. We'll see you in a bit. What a breath. I usually 1v1 before I match, though, against Faker. Yeah, I do that too against Faker. <laughs> you know Faker watches uh, Demonte VODs? <laughs> They're going on to him. Oh, it's Papa Chow looking to set this play up as Dardot comes in with the missile from long range away and it's first blood over to Demonte. Let's go. 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 let Wild Turtle forced to be saved right now as Dardock makes his entry with that ultimate. Gonna be in the middle of the fight. The double kill over to Altec, and that is it. They take down nearly the entirety of the enemy team. That last one shot down. Welcome back to Assist of the Week. In this episode, we're taking a look at a perfectly coordinated five-man dive in the bot lane by Cloud9. The TSM duo of Sven and Mithy had no chance to survive this onslaught. Cloud9 locked down the first two kills and the first turret of the game. Four, first blood over to C9 in style. That was so well executed by C9. Perfect timing as the minion wave is crashing. Five man fought the beautiful Sharima shuffle there from Jensen. They get two kills. They will get the first turret.